So welcome back. Hope you really enjoyed the launch. So a couple of announcements before we start. Uh, one is to, especially to the note takers from the previous session to please send the notes to Jane or, or me, probably to Jane, because probably you might have her email address. So feel free, so whenever it's, it's time, uh, you, oh sorry, it's, it's when you get time, then please feel, give it to Jane. Uh, either send her on the email if you have it electronic, or feel free to just pass on the notes that you have from the sessions as well, whichever, and either way is fine for us. So. Um, we would be thankful there. Yes. So those uh, who may have given back your headphones, you may need to get it back because we have speakers who will speak in uh, Russian language. So please quickly. Uh, take some time to grab a uh, headphone as well. Uh, you'll need to bring your ID to get a headphone, just a reminder. So f it's it's really difficult to make people awake after, especially after the session, after the lunch. So we'll try to keep you awake uh, with an interesting panel here. So we'll just wait for friends who are coming in with the headsets. Um, so in the meantime, let's start uh, the session. So, uh, welcome back after the launch. Um, so, on so the next session is breaking the cycle of violence, uh, particularly looking at how do you we uh, strengthen our works with men as fathers, as caregivers in the prevention in violence prevention area. So just to start and help you uh, to get into the mood, uh, I just want to request you to just take a few seconds maybe or one minute maximum to think of about your childhood to go back to your childhood when when did you start uh, understanding or or being forced to behave in a certain way when when were when is it that you became aware of oh you are certainly different than somebody else in your family or in your school so just take some time so go as back as possible your childhood um, and those who do not want to do that feel free not to do that as well because we do realize you know while going back for some people it can be traumatic uh, but for those who do not feel afraid of going back please do that so just take some time and and try to reflect as as back as possible during your childhood maybe you heard somebody saying you something maybe you were suddenly stopped while you were trying to do something or play. It can be anyone, someone from your own family, someone from your friend circle, someone from your school. Yeah, the few particular instances. Yeah. So slowly get out of there and try to recall the last moment you think you have used or shown or expressed 
any forms of anger, violence upon someone else. Could be in your own family, could be in your work area. Yeah, so maybe there are a range of things that are coming into your mind now. So we're trying to understand what happens through across the our life cycle to really understand the way certain people or we ourselves as men, women, people of different gender identities and social orientation behave in, in the context where we are from. So and and trying to recall how that process and understanding of, of that process can inform some of the programs we do. To look at it from a prevention perspective. And a lot of works we are doing with men in particular around fatherhood, involving in caregiving as a man, many of our programs are informed through this understanding and see how that experiences of individual can be utilized to prevent violence and also in the same time break the cycle of violence because as we know you know it, it starts from the very early age it goes on I would not go into the uh, the data I was thinking of just showing these figures for you to understand how the experience that you just were trying to recall in it during your childhood has an impact later in our life and how that shapes our behaviors our attitudes uh, our own relationships to certain individuals in our own families, in our friends, and people we work with. So it has a lot, uh, uh, and this is what I used to use when I save. So just to look at you know how this impacts and how these different experiences, including uh, the oppressions, the, the systemic oppression that's around us, the discrimination that happens to us in multiple areas of, of our lifetime, and how all that relates to shaping the behavior that we have today and to understand how and why certain people behave in a certain way they do. So just to keep, keep that in mind uh, and then to try and relate to, to our own experiences. So what today in the session that we are really trying to do is to unpack a little bit on, on just this piece on how do we really break the cycle of violence and this cycle of violence has a you know, multifaceted effect on, on our own lives, on the lives of people and children uh, or people around us, both in relationships or any forms of relationships we have. But the reason I'm taking this as a, as a framework, just to put it out there, uh, you don't have to agree with, with this framework because particularly I, I really like it, uh, but at least or not like it in the sense the way it is framed, but it helps me to think on some of the aspects on the work we are doing. Um, so how do we relate to the childhood experience of violence, the intimate partner violence that happens in a family, irrespective of the various forms of families we come from, not particularly looking at one way of understanding family, but multiple forms of family, and keep that in mind, but also to look at how does, uh, where does the intersections between intimate partner violence, violence against women, and violence against children interact to form a sort of cycle of violence that perpetuates different inequalities, injustice, and discrimination as we grow up. And we as actors in those process also, you know, we have, it's not that I have never used violence, right? So how do we, you know, are forced to, to whether or not we like it, forced to adhere to certain ideologies, certain behaviors. So these are some of the questions we are, we are trying to understand uh, from the presentations as well. So without delay, I would like to start with a short introduction. For I'm not going to read the bio of the presenters. Uh, you have it in your folder. Feel free to just look at it. I, I'd quickly like to request the presenters to present or just introduce yourself short. Hi, you've all seen me already. I'm Ruti Levtev, a senior research and program officer at Promundo. Good afternoon, I'm Kate Doyle, a senior program officer with Promundo. Good afternoon, I'm Lita Lamkasa, an executive director for Hewitt Ethiopia. I'm from Ethiopia. Hi, I'm Marina Pisklakova parker from Russia, Moscow, Santa Ana. Hi, I'm Sergei Zaharov, Center Anna, St. Petersburg, Russia. Great. Uh, my name is Loxman. Apologies again. 
I realized later I didn't introduce one in the beginning. So my name is Lok, and I'm bad in introducing myself and who I am. And I probably I'm a little shy on introducing who I am. Uh, that's that's my ex childhood experience, and and that that's how it relates to me on uh, presenting. So my name is Lakshman Bilbase. I work at the Global Secretariat of Meningiz Alliance um, as uh, in the role of networks uh, manager. So I support uh, our country and regional networks uh, across the globe uh, on the work they do and help them to connect together to foster both uh, sharing and experiences uh, across the regions and across the world to help inform uh, our initiatives as well as connect. Uh, you know, on the works we are doing. Uh, so we'll try to focus more on looking at it. You know, as the you know Gary was mentioning, you know, in the morning, the, it's time for action. So we are right moving on into that uh, with the presenters as well. So may I invite uh, Gitalem from Ethiopia for your presentation? Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Gitalem Kasa, an executive director for Hewitt Ethiopia. Uh, I, will, I will show you uh, the experience that uh, Hewitt Ethiopia or my organization have been implementing in Ethiopia uh, regarding uh, on child sexual abuse, reduction of all child sexual abuse and exploitation through engaging men and boys. So. Uh, First, I will start from uh, uh, the country uh, profile. So, uh, Ethiopia is situated in the Horn of Africa. The country is at the crossroads between the Middle East and Africa. Thus, throughout its long history, Ethiopia has been a melting pot for of diverse customs and cultures. Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Sub-Saharan Africa, over 90 million uh, people living in Ethiopia. In, uh, uh, this is 2015 data. And grows rapidly at an average annual rate of 2.6%. 45% of the population is being below 15 years of the age. Here at Ethiopia, was established in 1995 as an, an anti-AIDS club uh, by 14 young people, it's already 21 years back, concerned about the devastating effects of uh, HIV AIDS and wish to make a positive contribution to, com to combat, combating the spread of uh, the disease. And it grows and developed into an association, then a registered NGO, and is now re-registered as an Ethiopian residence charity, delivering a, ra uh, a range of uh, multi-year projects with uh, a variety of local and international uh, partners. It has uh, five thematic program, programmatic areas, health, education, protection, livelihood, and environment. Hewitt Ethiopia has become well known for its pioneering work with uh, boys and men to tackle child sexual abuse, exploitation, and GBV among children and youth groups in Ethiopia. So uh, currently there are different organizations are engaged in uh, boys and men engagement issue. So Hewitt Ethiopia is a pioneer organization almost since 2005 uh, have been implementing the issues. Violence in Ethiopia. A 2011 study reported that 76.5% of women faced intimate uh, partner violence in their uh, lifetime. 49% uh, of uh, children aged 11 to 17 
experienced physical punishment within 12 months. This is the 2014 data. Differing economic activities affect family dynamics and the likelihood of children experiencing violence. Family structure and circumstances often shaped by poverty also play a role in children's experience of violence, parental days, divorce, etc. Consequences of abuse and exploitation. Sexual exploitation of children in Ethiopia causes huge physical, mental, and social harm to the, to the victim. They drop out of school, infected with HIV, exposed for stress, and the like. Mostly girls are being sexually exploited. It happened to, by, it, it happened to boys too. For boys, it is even more difficult to get help. There are no programs specifically uh, focusing on boys, whereas sexual, sexual abuse of boys is still considered to be taboo into Ethiopia. Laws and legislations. Ethiopia has signed, ratified, and adopted various international and regional legal instruments. Article 9 of 4 of the federal constitution makes all international treaties ratified by Ethiopia part of the law of the constitution of the country. In Ethiopia, existing legislations and policies prohibit violence against children. In practice, implementation and application of these laws and policies has been ineffective, while intersectoral coordination has been weak. Here is Ethiopia's commitment, my organization's commitment to work on boys and men. As you may know, different uh, platforms, meetings, and uh, sessions are also encouraging my organization to engage on boys and men for gender equality. In patriarchal society like Ethiopia, men are assumed not to be involved in of their attitudes and behavior towards family and gender relationship difficult to change. Participation of men in the efforts to promote gender mainstreaming and gender equality is a topic of concern that is given too little attention and value. Gender equality is often perceived as an issue of women, while men are perceived to be privileged and or not affected. So let's come to the uh, program, Yenigatwag Radio, it's a radio show. Yenigatwag is Amharic word, so we use the Amharic word directly translate to the English word. So I don't have any definition about this, so Yenigatwag is the Amharic word. Amharic is the uh, national language of Ethiopia. So the radio show is an interactive radio show among the projects that Youth Ethiopia has been implementing since 2008 with the technical and financial support of Oak Foundation. The show is aired into two well-known radio stations, Fana 98.1 and Shagar 102.1. The radio show prefers Amharic language as a major communication to address the community at large. Amharic is a national language of the country. Boys and men do care. Addressing child sexual abuse and exploitation is the motto of the radio show. There are two objectives. To increase public recognition of the positive role of men and boys in the protection of Child, children from sexual abuse and exploitation. The second one is to increase collaboration efforts among schools and other child-focused organizations. Program targets, children and youth, boys and men, parents, teachers, celebrities, community groups, and institutions, policy and decision makers are the targets of 
the major target for the radio show. Contents, engaging boys and men, fatherhood, parenting, child sexual abuse and exploitation, gender-based violence, male gender norms, child protection and participation, health, HIV, adolescent and youth health and the like. Approach of the radio show. It is an interactive radio show through entertaining with drama and music, capture real stories, practices and share to the public, facilitate interactive dialogue sessions, interview with professionals, celebrities, model fathers and parents. Major activities. Broadcasting and rebroadcasting re interactive 20 minutes radio show every Friday morning, Tuesday afternoon, and Wednesday evening through FM radio stations. The show tentatively aired for 60 minutes per week and 2,880 minutes per year. In addition to this, 30 second short public message aired four times per week, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday through the two uh, FM uh, stations. In and out of school listeners, group were established and strengthened to discuss on the weekly radio message. The radio show created partnership with schools and share messages every week for school mini media to disseminate the message for school com community. Promoted the radio show through different publications stickers, newspapers, leaflets, including social media, uh, uh, web, uh, Facebook. There are different uh, 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 calendars. This is calendar already. We print this calendar to promote uh, men and boys engagement issue. This is Amharic version. We have also stickers. So we publish these stickers sticker and uh, you know, disseminating and posting at the uh, towns. So it is already. We have also a quarterly based newspaper. So in this newspaper, we also uh, promoting uh, the radio program for uh, uh, listeners. And also we have uh, publications for communicating with uh, non Amharic uh, speakers using different material, so there is copy into the reception. Achievements. The issue of child protection, the issue of child protection, particularly protecting children from sexual abuse, exploitation, and GBV through engaging boys and men has become a public issue. When we start this program, uh, uh, different institutions in Ethiopia you know, opposing us, now they are part of even the program, just like the women associations and the like. Children who were affected and vulnerable to abuse and exploitation have been able to report the, the incidents to respective schools, police, child protection units, the radio show, and the community. The listeners and model parents promoters group started to promote the importance of boys and men engagement to end child sexual abuse, exploitation, DBV at home, community, and an institution level through different community-based meetings and gathers. Various media, various medias have already started to mainstream the importance of men and boys engagement to end GBV and ensure uh, gender equality. What has initiated men and boys engage network by, by the support of our foundation and Sonke Gender Justice to make issues at national level. Most network members and partners mainstreamed men and boys issues across their projects and programs. Ministry of Children and Women Affairs Office has established systems and mechanisms to advocate the importance of men and boys. Recently they have uh, developed uh, uh, manual, so this is a big achievement, and ensure their commitment to work with Hewitt Ethiopia and Main Engaged Network of Ethiopia. 
So we have different uh, monitoring uh, mechanisms. Uh, uh, the first one is feedback have been collected from listeners, uh, established in, in and out of a school listeners group to uh, monitor the issues, the quality of publications, messages, uh, consultative discussions, sessions were conducted with media professionals, listeners group, model fathers and the like to know the, uh, to know the, to measure or to know the uh, quality uh, message already distributed by the radio program, disseminated by the radio program. Advisory board members have been actively involved in planning and monitoring sessions. Regular reports submitted to the management team and discussed on the issues. So I will, I have it four stories, but I will focus on one, one of the story because of time. I am a dedicated father. Elias Ababa is from Addis Ababa and is a father of two children, whom are 16 and 13 years old. Elias refers to himself as a dedicated father who has tried his be best to be around home for his kids, but he confesses different problems. He was getting angry and impatient with his children. He struggled to understand their demands, needs, and requirements. Elias confirmed some of the topics have made a huge impact on his parenting skills and make him to be a good dad. About the program, he says, each time I listen to the show, it puts tangible change in my life and shape me, shaped me, shapes me each, me each day for positive thinking and outcomes as a father. He is also willing to be interviewed by the young, by the Nigatwag uh, radio program. Can I add one? Changed my family. Jorgo Diriva, married woman from Addis Ababa, all men should listen to your radio show. I am a regular listener of your radio show, and once I invited my husband to listen to, show, to the show as well. He was inspired by what he heard, and now he never missed the weekly radio show, especially when he listened to stories about model fathers. He was surprised and asked himself, who am I? Before he started to listen to the radio show, he was not concerned about everything at home, at home. But now, thanks to your radio show, there is change into my family. He began to care and support for his family and committed to be a model father to our family. So let's keep, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Gitalem. Uh, really inspiring story of uh, you know how you have been able to use radio so as a means to reach out to uh, the community members, uh, including you know having significant impact on the lives of these you know fathers who listen to your radio stories. Um, and I always have been fan of Hewat uh, since uh, you know you had been working with from this intergenerational dialogue approach on where they had boys clubs and, and parents club and they used to discuss on the issues of even uh, which we uh, don't do at in Nepal back home where I'm, I'm from on the issues of sexuality education. So that was uh, amazing. Uh, and thank you for, for highlighting uh, the comprehensive approach you have uh, used uh, in your program. So um, following that, I would like to uh, invite Marina Parker and Sergi uh, Zakharov uh, to present about their work on wa working with fathers in the National Network of Women's Shelter and how Center Anna um, works with boys and men in implementing accountability, very important aspect uh, in, in their work. So, here you go. You can use this as well, whichever way. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. We, we Switch will, to Russian, please. Yes. We will be Remind speaking Russian, so please put your headphones on.
Итак, мы будем говорить с вами о работе с отцами. А название, на... название нашей презентации «Работа с отцами». Работа с отцами, э, опыт, опыт, э, сети. опыт сети против э, насилия. А мы переводили эту презентацию на английский, честно говоря, вот только э, буквально там э, до ланча. Поэтому если там будут какие-то ошибки или еще что-то, мы заранее извиняемся. Да, и это действительно наша совместная работа. А, как, вот. Итак, Центр Анна. Кто мы? Центр Анна развивался с начала 90-х. Я создала в 93-м году первый телефон доверия для женщин, страдающих от насилия в семье. И от организации, которая была создана, в общем-то, одним человеком, мы выросли до, на сегодняшний день, такого национального ресурсного центра, который помогает развиваться и отдельным организациям, и региональным сетям в России. Мы, мы проводим тренинги, стажировки, э, с, у нас создаются различные э, экспертные группы для мониторинга ситуации с насилием в отношении женщин. Мы проводим и координируем национальную э, кампанию, и также э, кампанию по всей стране, например, э, «16 дней без насилия». Э, Телефон доверия, который был создан в 1993 году, сегодня работает как э, всероссийский телефон доверия, бесплатный для э, женщин, которые могут позвонить даже с мобильного телефона. И э, на сегодняшний день более 100 тысяч женщин получили нашу помощь. Э, национальная сеть. Сеть организаций – это неформальная сеть, которую мы координируем. Более 120 организаций, государственных и негосударственных, входят в эту сеть. В том числе аффилированными членами этой сети являются организации из Молдовы, Беларуси, Таджикистана, Киргизстана, бывших постсоветских стран. И это все организации, для которых мы также либо проводили тренинги, либо продолжаем с ними работать и работаем по сегодняшний день. Основные цели нашей организации – это... Повышение осознанности проблемы насилия в отношении женщин как нарушение прав человека, развитие и создание различных моделей реагирования на разные формы насилия в отношении женщин, создание атмосферы нулевой толерантности по отношению к насилию в отношении женщин. И работа с проблемой насилия в отношении женщин как с нарушением прав человека. За время своего существования Центр Анна опубликовал и распространил более 5 миллионов образовательных материалов и провели более 200 семинаров для различных целевых групп. Эта компания называется «Домашнему насилию оправданий нет» и она ведется в России с 1998 -го года. Одной из таких новых, одним из новых направлений, которые мы начали буквально лет пять назад, является мониторинг ситуации и издание регулярных ежегодных докладов о ситуации насилия в отношении женщин в России. И вот это пример нашего последнего доклада, который мы опубликовали в начале этого года. Он называется «Хроники тишины» о ситуации насилия в отношении женщин. И э, этот доклад мы опубликовали уже как организация, внесенная в реестр э, иностранных агентов России. Ну и статистика. Статистику оценить э, по ситуации э, насилия в отношении женщин довольно сложно, потому что нет законопроекта, поэтому, соответственно, очень сложно не только латентность, но и вообще даже те преступления, которые совершены, э, нам приходилось из всех официальных источников оценивать и высчитывать примерный а, а, как бы размер насилия. И вот к чему мы пришли. В среднем а, более 600 женщин погибают ежемесячно в России. А, я не добавила здесь, что это ежемесячно. 
в России в результате домашнего насилия. И ежегодно около одного миллиона женщин подвергаются насилию в семье. С некоторого времени мы, в общем-то, с самого начала, еще с 90-х, мы задумывались над тем, что когда мы начинаем говорить о проблеме насилия, получается, что как бы женщины говорят между собой об этом. И э, мы думали все время о том, как же нам э, расширить э, эту дискуссию. И у нас был такой проект э, «Вовлечение молодежи». То есть проект был необычным с точки зрения того, что мы сначала э, в девяти университетах э, в России планировали создать э, лидерские группы для девушек и группы соконсультирования для профилактики насилия на свиданиях и сексуального насилия. И когда мы начали работать в университетах и проводили первые дискуссионные площадки для студентов, оказалось, что эта тема очень волнует и молодых людей. И к нам вот в эти лидерские группы пришли и девушки, и юноши. И нас это очень обрадовало. И поэтому работать мы стали и с мальчиками, и с девочками. И дальше эта программа пошла, вот это пример ситуации на Северном Кавказе. Буквально, например, в Чечне студенты создавали такую кампанию против насилия, гендерного насилия в отношении женщин и против гендерного неравенства. Вот здесь молодой человек держит плакат и говорит «Я всегда буду уважать женщин». У нас э, так, такие, э, как бы, так, такая компания развивалась э, в, общем -то, в разных регионах России. Э, еще у нас есть такая программа стажировки, куда приезжают э, представители государственных и негосударственных организаций, и мы им э, как бы передаем все методы работы, которые у нас есть, которые мы наработали за эти годы. С некоторых пор в группах стали появляться мужчины. И теперь это мужчины, которые не просто с нами работают, но и в регионах являются лидерами. Тогда, да, тогда мы сейчас переходим плавно к отцовству, потому что мы выбираем свое время э, очень... Давай. Да, в общем, коллеги, мы сейчас поговорим тогда о программе отцовства, которая в итоге действительно... Получилось так, что имплементировалась вот эта национальная сеть, но она прошла определенный путь, который был, ну, вот условно мы говорим про 10 лет от такого активизма до уже имплементации в национальную сеть против насилия. Ну, собственно, 2000-е годы они ознаменовались в России такой достаточно активным, началом такого активного интереса, потому что до этого был достаточно бессистемный интерес в отношении отцовства, начали больше, все активней, например, участвовать в родах и так далее, и так далее. И, собственно, начало, как бы пришло время для разговора об отцовстве. И, собственно, те люди, которые работали, те активисты в общественных организациях, в социальной сфере, почувствовали эту атмосферу и начали тоже смотреть, что можно сделать для того, чтобы поддержать отцов. Собственно, вот мы, наши коллеги, мои коллеги, которые работали в социальной сфере, активисты, мы начали думать, что делать, что делать с отцами, как с ними работать. И в 2007 году у нас появилась такая общественная инициатива, которая объединила этих специалистов, и мы, конечно, начали работу с... Ну, мы их называем беременные папы. Ну, это самый простой был путь для того, чтобы начать диалог об отцовстве с достаточно мотивированной группой. Ну и, собственно, нам помогли в этом наши шведские коллеги вот, из организации «Мужчины за гендерное равенство», которые дали нам некий толчок и некую базу методическую для того, чтобы мы стартовали. И в течение этого времени мы начали работу, и подключались какие-то еще коллеги, другие активисты. И, в общем, эта тема отцовства, особенно это касалось Санкт-Петербурга, Северо-Запада России, начала обрастать различными сервисами. Да? Это и папа школы, это и появившийся день отца, 
и папин журнал, специальный журнал для отцов, и различные флешмобы, рекламные кампании и так далее, и так далее. Это такой был, начиналось такое обрастание сервисами. Ну и, собственно, вот то, что мы начали вот эту дискуссию, появился этот контекст, и мы, в том числе, наверное, и наша работа, и работа наших коллег, так или иначе повлияла и на изменения системные, в том числе и в законодательстве. И, собственно, вот самые основные вещи, которые произошли, изменилось законодательство в в праве на бесплатное участие отцов в родах. Это федеральный закон Российской Федерации. В концепцию семейной политики России внедрена была тема отцовства и необходимость поддержки форм работы с отцами. В трудовом кодексе Российской Федерации появилась статья о о том, что отец имеет право на равноправное, равноправие в отношении отпуска по уходу за ребенком. И вот тот формат, который мы предложили в папа групп он вошел даже в концепцию семейной политики нашего города Санкт-Петербурга. Какие еще результаты? Ну, те сервисы, которые мы как общественная инициатива, как активисты развивали, они начали имплементироваться в государственные некоммерческие организации. И, собственно, например, папа группы достаточно активно развиваются до сих пор и начали имплементироваться в работу женских консультаций и центров, государственных центров помощи семьям. Ну, собственно, наша позиция в том, что мы считаем, что язык отцовства – это такой достаточно эффективный, эффективный инструмент против насилия и за гендерное равенство. Это эффективный и безопасный инструмент. И, по-моему, не, вот не Гина говорила да, в своем выступлении, что это действительно очень эффективный инструмент общения с консервативными группами, да, чтобы мы не говорим напрямую о гендерном равенстве не говорим, а мы говорим через язык отцовства. И он принимаемый, он воспринимаемый. И, в общем, мы это видим, на самом деле, на примере на нашей практике. И начали, собственно, нашу работу имплементировать, в, развивать через женские кризисные центры. Марина потом дополнит меня в конце, как это, почему мы это сделали, почему для нас это было важно. В итоге сейчас, уже сейчас, вот 13 регионов России, кризисные женские кризисные центры используют программы поддержки отцовства в своей работе. Для того, чтобы говорить не только говорить об отцовстве и с мужчинами, и с женщинами. И в 2016 году появилась такая наша первая точка, точка отсчета, я бы так назвал, новая точка отсчета истории темы отцовства в России. Мы совместно с Академией наук Российской Федерации выпустили доклад «Положение отцов в России», и он переведен на английский язык, и, собственно, на сайте Менкер вы можете ознакомиться с ним на английском языке в том числе. Ну, вот те, мы выделили, наверное, те, те белые пятна, которые необходимы, и мы считаем очень важны для того, чтобы мы сегодня обсуждали, и для того, чтобы двигаться дальше. Это то, что мы видим, и то, что мы считаем важным, о чем важно говорить. Первое, то, что у нас есть достаточно много, мы видим много групп отцов, которые не... Которых, для которых не сделаны сервисы различные. Да? Ну, например, мы можем говорить об отцах детей-инвалидах, об отцах-одиночках. К сожалению, пока это не так сильно развито. Но, например, вот сегодня вы видели уже пример... Сейчас, две минуты. Например, сегодня был классный пример наших коллег, врачей и детям, которые действительно сделали новые программы для детей, для, для отцов, в кризисной ситуации. Это очень здорово, вот это новая, новая точка. Что еще важно отметить? Вот бизнес, который дружественной семье, бизнес дружественное отцовство и так далее, и так далее. Ну и, собственно, вот моя персональная история, мои, мои вызовы, которые я испытываю сегодня на этом, на этом мероприятии. Вот у меня двое детей, одному три месяца, и я вот с телефоном стою, а и мне вот жена постоянно значит, спрашивает, где свидетельство о рождении, где у меня 
значит, э, э, надо записаться только на массаж на 13 июня. То есть я как бы вот в такой ситуации нахожусь в балансе, пытаюсь это как-то решить. Это не просто для меня, это первый такой выезд после рождения, но тем не менее. И я передаю Марине. Чтобы завершить, да, спасибо, Сереж. Чтобы завершить, просто скажу, почему мы все-таки выбрали работать с такой программой. Во-первых, Нигина действительно очень хорошо осветила вызовы нашего региона. Это и рост консерватизма, и ретрадиционализм. И вот это является такой более легкой точкой, вообще программа отцовства является более такой понятной точкой входа для того, чтобы говорить, например, о распределении ролей внутри семьи. Для, ну и есть еще один важный момент. Для того, чтобы гендерное равенство действительно появлялось, нужно, чтобы и женщины перестали смотреть на, традиционно на роли мужчины в семье и в обществе. Поэтому для нас это ну, как бы дополнительная возможность, которая позволяет и развивать как бы, осознанность необходимости гендерного равенства. Ну и, конечно же, то, о чем говорил уже Лексман сегодня, то, что это профилактика насилия, начиная с того, что дети растут совершенно другой новой ролевой моделью. Ну и да, и мы еще... Спасибо за внимание. Thank you very much. Uh, really great to hear, you know, some of the realizations you have had with your own programming that does resonate with many of us, you know, uh, on, on the realization that, oh, suddenly we need to, yeah, we have to think about how do we work with boys and men in this context. Uh, and that's how I started my journey with engaging boys and men too. And I think it's amazing to see you know, how far you have been able to reach, both in terms of policy advocacy and the achievements there, and also to look at the individual lives as well. And also the, the dilemma of where do we become professional and where do we become fathers is something I think most of us and many of us who are involved in the work do grapple with uh, daily. So thanks for reminding that. Um, so next then I would like to invite Ruthi and Kate to present on the evidences. You know, many a times when we go and do our advocacy work, people always ask, oh, do you have evidence? Does it work? So probably, you know, that's, that's where this will be really helpful on uh, realizing how to build an evidence base for our programming, advocacy, and other efforts. So over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Lakshman. And yeah, we're going to continue on the trend of co-presenting, uh, because this is research that actually we started preparing for back in 2013. Um, and Ruti and I have been yeah, very much involved in it since that time, so we're excited to be able to share some of the findings from that research with everyone. Um, and we're going to be sharing an example of an adapted version of Program P that was implemented in Rwanda. Uh, but before we start, we do want to mention that we're really sad that our colleagues from Rwanda could not be here. Uh, unfortunately, all of their visas were denied. So we had originally envisioned that we would sort of co-present and be able to share a bit more about the programmatic aspects uh, through the roundtable discussions. Um, so, so we hope we'll do them justice. Um, so as I mentioned, it's an adapted version of Program P that was implemented in Rwanda, but it was situated within a larger program called MenCare Plus, uh, which we have some other partners like Sonke and Rutgers uh, in the room with us here today. And within this larger program that was trying to promote men's engagement in sexual and reproductive health and maternal, newborn, and child health, one component, aside from working with young men and women and working with health providers, was fathers or couples groups. So reaching out to fathers as that entry point, as uh, the Center Anna example was sharing, of an opportunity to engage with fathers and couples around issues of violence and gender equality and couple relationships. Um, and it was implemented in Rwanda by the Rwanda Men's Resource Center, or RAMREC, um, which I know there's other partners in the room who have worked with them as well. 
and it is a gender transformative group education. So trying to create spaces to actually challenge inequitable gender norms, but also learn and practice more equitable behaviors um, and creating spaces for couples. So not just men, although the program is targeting men and recruiting them uh, into the program via the male partner, it was really focused on the couple relationship. Um, so it was targeting couples who are between the ages of 21 and 35 years old, who are either young or new or expectant parents. So some came into the groups, about 25%, as first-time parents, um, expecting their child on the way. And others came into the groups with maybe one child under the age of five in the household, creating opportunities also for sharing across um, different experiences. And it was adapted from Program P over a nine-month period of formative research, piloting with community members, piloting with the Ministry of Health, uh, eliciting feedback from different institutions as well as community members themselves. How can we make this program better, more applicable to the daily lives of the participants? And the resulting curriculum was 15 weekly sessions. Um, led by community facilitators, so fathers themselves, many of whom actually participated in the pilot. You know, had no previous training or experience facilitating any type of program in their community. And the sessions included seven sessions targeting directly to men, but eight sessions that are couples-based, so men come with their partners. So each group had about 12 participants, so when partners were together, 24 people in total. And the topics included fatherhood, gender and power, um, family communication and decision-making, understanding and speaking out about violence, conflict resolution, among a number of others, but really focusing on creating that space to work with couples around couple communication, discussing issues together. You know, do women want men to be involved in these areas? I think it highlights some of what was discussed in the panel early this morning. And the intervention was designed specifically to address men's participation, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and child health. So antenatal care visits, getting involved during pregnancy, discussing and communicating about family planning, as well as violence against women. Um, and particularly the areas where this program was implemented were chosen because they were areas where there were high rates of gender-based violence, and also areas where there were fewer programs that had been reaching the community members. Um, and as well as obviously couple dynamics and relationship, including particularly unpaid care and trying to promote more equitable distribution or redistribution of care work within the household. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ruti now, who's gonna to start to share a little bit about the design of the study, and then we'll bring it back to some findings. So, um, as Lakshman mentioned, one of the things that we get asked a lot is, okay, you're doing these programs, you're investing a lot of resource in the, resources in these programs, do they work? What, what happens when people participate in these types of programs? So with this implementation in Rwanda, we had the opportunity to design a study to really try to get a, a very high level of evidence on what was working. So we designed what's called a randomized control trial. Many of you might be familiar with this from uh, testing of medications or drugs. Um, the reason randomized control trials are often considered a really sort of strong uh, level of evidence is because you're able to attribute any changes that you see to the actual intervention because the people who participate in the intervention versus the people that you compare them to were selected at random. There, there's kind of a lottery that sends some people into the intervention and some people not into the intervention. So we have a control group, people who didn't participate, and an intervention group that did. So the sites were the same sites of the implementation of the, of the entire project. It's four districts in Rwanda, and as Kate mentioned, districts that were perhaps underserved in terms of programs related to violence. Um, we had approximately 1,200 couples, 600, about 575 who were in the intervention. So these are men plus their partners. Um, and then 624 couples in the co control group. So the people in the control group were interviewed, but they did not receive any kind of intervention. So we collected information from them, but they, they did not participate in the, in the intervention. Um, and the study was funded uh, through uh, the Dutch SRHR fund, the MacArthur Foundation, an anonymous donor. Um, we collected data at three different time points. 
So before the intervention started, what we call the baseline, we collected data then um, nine months after the baseline, which the, the intervention itself is 15 weeks. So this is approximately four or five months after the intervention ended. And then we were really interested in seeing, well, do these changes, are they sustained? Do they, do they kind of stay there over time? So we then went back and collected another round of data 21 months after the, the baseline. Okay, so, so we're looking at about a year and a half after, after the intervention ended. Um, it's important to note that with a lot of these changes, while it's very important to ask men about the changes that they've experienced or that they're reporting, we're also interested in hearing from women. What has their experience been like? So, um, so that's what we did. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about our findings. And again, we're really excited to share these. 21 months is a really long time to wait to see what, what, you know, what we've got. Um, I'm going to share here, or we're going to share here, the findings from the 21-month uh, data collection. But we actually, they're very, very similar to the one, the midline that we did, right? So about, about um, nine months after baseline. We looked at both of those and the results are really, really similar, which is very interesting to see that a change happened and remained for, for another year. So let me start by talking about um, findings around rates of violence. Now again, what we're doing here is we're comparing whatever outcome we're looking across in the intervention group compared to the control group. Um, we have really striking findings around intimate partner violence. These are women's reports of violence that they experienced in the last 12 months. Um, before we compare anything, I just wanted to mention that these are really, really high rates of violence. I think this is something that we hear across this panel and across you know, all the, day, all, you know, the whole day, things that we've heard. Um, we see here that in the control group, oh dear, in the control group we have 57% of women who reported experiencing physical violence, 60% who reported experiencing sexual violence, and in the intervention group that is, thank you, that is you know, almost half of that. So this is a really, really, substantial difference, again, those rates are still really high. We also looked at rates of violence against children, so use of harsh punishment against children. This was not a very um, strong focus in the intervention, but it was something that was discussed. And as part of our theory of change, we assumed that if you're starting to talk to people about violence and the use of violence, this might um, link into their, their use of violence with children. Um, and here we also see some big differences between the intervention and the control group, although the rates are still quite high. Oh, and I should mention, uh, for those of, for whom this is relevant, all of these findings are statistically significant. Yeah, and maybe I'll add, we're, we're sharing a number of key outcomes here, um, but we've also collected a whole range of additional outcomes, which we'll be getting to eventually. <laughs> um, but obviously the program is situated in a program looking at sexual and reproductive health and reproductive uh, and maternal newborn child health. So we also see that compared to the control group, Participants in the intervention group, based on both men's and women's responses, you know, have higher rates of modern contraceptive use. Uh, women are attending more antenatal care visits than women in the control group. Um, and men are accompanying their partners to more antenatal care visits as well. Um, we also see that women reported having more support from their partner, and that's on a range of supports, like financial support, cooking in the household, uh, offering emotional support, uh, spiritual support during pregnancy. And you know, as was highlighted this morning, unpaid care is a particular issue that we were interested in looking at. Uh, so we measured it by asking participants both who's doing what in the household and then how much time are you spending on those activities. And one of the things that we're pleased to see is that there is more sharing of household tasks and child care within the couples who participated in the intervention. So men are more frequently involved in these tasks with their partners. Um, and we see also that men in the intervention group report spending nearly one hour more per day than men in the control group on these activities. So you can see the hours of spent um, on the presentation. But one of the things that we see is women are obviously still spending a lot more time on these activities than men are. Um, and one of the things that we're interested in, in researching further is that while men are 
taking a more active role in sharing these activities with their partners, we didn't actually see a subsequent decrease in the time that women are spending on these activities. So in the control and intervention groups, it's, it's quite balanced in terms of how many hours women are continuing to spend on these activities. But a positive finding is that women in the intervention group have more hours of sleep than women in the control group, and they also have more time to spend with their friends. So about one hour more sleep per day, and 20 minutes more time with friends than women in the control group. So that's a positive finding on its own. Um, we also see that men are less likely to dominate household decision making. Um, and there's a range of uh, sort of different um, household decisions that we've listed here, like income and expenses, spacing of children, a number of children to have. And we asked this about a range of, of different um, types of household decisions. You know, how often do you discuss them? Who's making the decision? Um, and we asked women also, do you think your partner appreciates or values your opinion on these decisions as well? Um, but you can see that there is a greater shift of women being more involved. Um, we didn't want to call that joint decision making, um, but we see that men are less dominating in these decisions within the household. I see we're running out of time, uh, but we're on our last slide. Uh, I think we're really excited to see, as Ruti said, that our theory of change is by working on couple communication and dynamics and power relations within the household, you really can address and have impact on multiple outcomes. Uh, we've seen historically a lot of programs promoting men's engagement, particularly in reproductive or maternal and newborn child health programs, focusing on one, maybe two outcomes only. And maybe there were other findings, but they weren't measuring those changes. Um, and we really do think that you know, efforts to engage men on these issues do need to be gender transformative, need to challenge attitudes and, and support and promote equitable alternatives. And we also find both through the qualitative research that we did and the survey, um, as well as the programmatic experience that gender synchronization or working together with both men and women was really important. And this was echoed by both men and women who participated. And even as the intervention evolved over time, because we, we did two cycles of the intervention before the cycle that we evaluated, each year we increased the number of sessions that were for couples uh, based on the reports of both men and women participating. Um, but we'd love to see additional adaptation and research to see could we address violence further. You know, as Ruti said, we have excellent findings of about you know, half the rates of violence, but violence is still high in these communities. Um, and obviously the issue of unpaid care. Are there ways that we can better redistribute? Um, and I think linking that to also what Nikki was sharing, technologies and other ways of addressing some of the care burden that women have, um, and better addressing violence against children, because it, it was a very limited focus in the intervention, so I think there's a lot more space um, that we could do. And of course, how do we take these things to scale? Um, so we're not just talking about a few communities where we're able to work, but that more people are reached by these interventions um, and removing some of the structural barriers uh, to promoting more gender equitable interventions as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and th I think, yeah, you know, this is really helpful to, you know, make an argument on the, you know, the, the programs we are trying to develop really work you know, if we do it properly and, and in a proper manner, and then also to look at how do we scale it, scale it up uh, in the one. But I think you know, I really uh, love the idea of when we develop or implement or, or, or try to contextualize any of the programs, the gender transformative approach and the lens need to be really embedded. Uh, in, a, in the particular context. And I think that's, that's very important uh, to remind as well. And I think uh, some of the programs, and that's an important point uh, as well, is what you mentioned is, you know, probably in the beginning we start with having focus on a particular area or particular behavior to change, but I think that results into multiple areas in terms of outcome. So how do we really be able to capture those as well? Uh, and, and how do we do it uh, is something uh, we uh, would be interesting to look at as well. So now we have a um, uh, little less than what I had expected, time for question and answer. So uh, the floor is yours, so please feel free to ask any questions. 
And when you ask questions, just also mention your name as well. That will be helpful. Yeah? I'm Joya Banerjee from Japaiko. Um, thank you to all of the presenters. That was excellent and very inspiring. My question is for Ruti and Kate. Um, I had a question about the finding that men are doing more one hour or more of work per day and why you think that might not reduce women's labor. Is it that men are self-reporting they're doing this work and maybe they're not or they're not helpful or what what's going on there and we're also really excited to be supporting the scale up of this program in rwanda thanks we'll take few more questions and then we'll try to see any other questions sure thank you uh, monica kweiser from the oecd uh, i have a really um a question to everybody on the panel, and I'd be interested in hearing a little bit of the pushback yeah, you got, because um, of course we've heard the stories of the people who were convinced, but I'm sure it wasn't so easy for all of you to do what you're doing, and that um, because these are strong, and we saw particularly uh, in, in, in Ethiopia and in Russia what you told us also about the, the cultural barriers you have to overcome in your work, so I'd be he interested in hearing a little bit about those problems that you had to overcome and how you how you are, how you are overcoming them. So one more, and then we'll get back to the camera. So Nikki, <laughs> um, I'd like to ask Marina and Sergey. I know you've been really involved in, in in the work on trying to change the domestic violence law in Russia. I, I'm just thinking about the link between that and the work that you're doing with men, and I'm interested in what support you've had from men to do that and how you see that going forward, because I know it's gone backwards. So you talked about re-traditionalization. Re I thought it was a really interesting term. I'd be interested to hear a bit more about that, because it's not just applicable in Russia. It's applicable in many other countries, too. Thank you. So uh, thanks for the question, Joya, around why do we think um, it might be that men increasing their time um, doing you know, housework and childcare doesn't necessarily reduce women's. Um, I think there's a lot of potential explanations for that. We haven't sort of gone into the data to explore uh, quite as much, and I don't know how much we'll be able to answer. Um, one is, I mean, both are self-reports. All time-use studies, or most time-use studies, tend to be self-reports, um, and we often see that people tend to overestimate their contribution and underestimate their partner's contribution. In this case, we are only asking about, you know, people's own, own work on particular tasks. Um, but it can be a lot of different things. I mean, I think we heard earlier, um, or in some of the tables, that, you know, if you had more time, you might do more things, you might do them better, you might do them longer, you might have a chance to do other things. Um, we know also uh, from discussions around uh, sometimes women as gatekeepers, they might be doing some of these tasks together, um, or they might be sort of watching or, or, or supervising how that's going. Um, again, I think it's something that would be really interesting to track over a longer time period as well. But Maybe I could start on pushback and then we okay. cascade along. Um, yeah, I think on the issue of pushback, if we think at the policy level in Rwanda, at least, um, there are very supportive policies of gender equality, of men's engagement, in reproductive health, in maternal health, in violence prevention. Um, so on that level, there, the Rwandan government, particularly the Ministry of Health, who was a partner on the project uh, and involved in the research, was very supportive and encouraging of programmatic examples that could actually help put those policies into practice, which a lot of times they were a bit lacking. Um, and because of their involvement and that policy engagement, local leaders were very heavily involved in the program um, at district level, at sector and cell and village level. So that created an environment in which there was actually sort of political status if you got to participate in the program as well. Um, so I think at the individual and relationship level, there's definitely still some pushback about taking on new roles, particularly around the care work. Um, but 
I think that's where we find it really important also that men and women are both engaged in that conversation because when we did formative research before adapting the program, men were often saying, well, we're getting a lot of that pushback from women, from our mothers or from our partners about taking on some of those activities. So we need to communicate and discuss together. You know, why are we doing this? Do you want us to help in this way? Um, all of those sort of aspects. So in that sense, I think there's a lot less pushback um, in this context than there might be in other contexts because of a number of reasons. Okay, thank you so much for the question. Uh, yeah, there are different challenges and problems there, but we are trying to address this, this uh, problems using different approach. For example, we have, okay, this is the radio program, so we have different uh, projects uh, targeting uh, 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 children and uh, uh, boys, and also uh, engaging men and uh, boys. We have different projects. For example, we have we have project uh, uh, implement is supported by Sonke. So uh, this program, this project, also enhancing, you know, the participation of uh, fathers. So we have group discussions and different uh, strategies to address the community. Of course, we have another program, projects, so we link our project each other and address the challenge. Of course, not yet solved. It needs further, further engagement and Im uh, implementation. Yes, sir. Um, to Russian, please switch. Для ответа вот Монике по поводу проблем, мы действительно сразу понимали, что большинство, исходя из того, что достаточно сильны традиционные ценности, патриархальные ценности в России, поэтому, конечно, многие отцы не готовы были бы к такому активному, вовлеченному отцовству. Поэтому мы сразу задали себе такой, как сказать, мультиформатный подход для тех, кто... Достаточно мотивирован это, например, папа группы, а для тех, кто низко мотивирован, это различные компании, день отца, журнал. То есть это вот такой, такой подход позвол, позволил те, кто был низко мотивирован, когда-то перейти на высоко мотивированную группу и так далее. То есть это вот, и это позволяло и позволяет на самом деле сейчас эту проблему каким-то образом решать. Okay, I will add uh, to the challenges uh, um, um, dealing with the culture uh, first. And uh, of course, uh, developing the program and working with, with fathers, we are targeting uh, gender equality issues. And uh, the first challenge is that gender is a bad word. Um, in Russia. So we uh, can more or less speak about equality of men and women, uh, but um, even that is not always easy. Um, and uh, so awareness campaigns are one way of dealing with that, and also finding strategic partnerships. For example, um, uh, we started working with um, independent trade unions. And uh, one of the independent trade unions in Russia, they have gender equality group, and they actually call it gender equality group. And we partnered with them, and um, Nikolai Yeremin, who many of you know, travels around the country, here is Nikolai, uh, travels around the country uh, conducting <laughs> conducting um, different training programs and working, developing um, really um, a very good program for them. Uh, and that links to the issue on legislation. Uh, my organization was actually listed as a foreign agent uh, in Russia because I was chairing a working group on um, developing legislation uh, addressing domestic violence in Russia. And uh, that was a huge, really, backlash and um, really a difficult time for us. But um, it, it doesn't mean it's not possible in Russia. I still believe that um, we just need to work more on awareness. Uh, 
The law was not passed because I think um, a lot of governmental officials uh, underestimate uh, the scope and con consequences of domestic violence for the whole society. And also, um, in that sense, for example, working with independent trade unions uh, helps us to raise awareness among uh, men in very masculine professions like sailors, constructors, fishermen. Um, so this is one of the strategic partnerships that we found um, very beneficial not just for you know the goal of um, finally having legislation on domestic violence in Russia, but also raising awareness on violence against women uh, in our society and uh, the need for equality between men and women in Russia. Great, thank you. Um, we have one more round for the questions. Hi, um, Anam Burves from Oxfam. I just wanted to respond to Joya's question, um, if I may, because we had very similar findings um, from one of our quant uh, quantitative impact evaluations of a livelihoods program, which was also looking to address care. Um, and yeah, we also found that men, while they were reporting that they were spending more time on care-related tasks, women, when we compared women in intervention and control groups, were saying that actually, yeah, they, they, there was no difference reported in, in, the, in their time use. Um, and when we followed it up with qualitative um, research, we found out that actually care activities which were previously being ignored were being taken up, so around hygiene and sanitation. Um, so that was something that was quite um, quite interesting for us. So I thought I'd share that as well. Uh, and then just a question around scale: um, what you mean by s what you mean by achieving scale? Because <laughs> we've been having a lot of these conversations internally as well. How do you achieve scales? Um, and how do you work with institutions at a macro level to be able to generate some of those changes? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Olaya Michelena from Make Mothers Matter. I just have a very quick question for the, all, the ta all the panel. So if you were the kings of the world, what would you do? Do you think that would really make the difference to actually transform fatherhood and really make a difference? If you could do anything, what would it be? Very short. Voila, difficult question. Great question. So you have a magic stick in your hand now. Be prepared. Yeah, so I'll be asking a similar question. If you can, would you be able to tell us uh, what, which components of your program make the changes so sustainable because your research results have been collected 16 months after the program has ended, which sounds amazing. Um, I'm coming from an organization that does fatherhood programs, and we're struggling to maintain sustainable results and impact on fathers. Thank you. Great. Um, one last question. Who would like to be the final? Where? Andre. Um, just a uh, quick question to Russia. I'm Andre Lavax from Sonke. Um, you've mentioned uh, it's around high motivated groups uh, and low motivated groups. So my assumption is that the high motivation groups is um, men that are more um, um, want to get more involved in care and the low motivation groups is men that are not so much uh, uh, involved in care. So what do you mean by that? And isn't it uh, much better to have a diverse group of people uh, where high motivation fathers actually affect low motivation fathers? Thank you. So who would like to start? Maybe we start the other way now? Yeah. 
Yeah. Можно я тогда отвечу коротко? Просто, наверное, может быть, не очень просто бы я понятно сказал, на самом деле. Мы, мы просто используем разный формат для разных групп отцов с разным видом мотивации. Для тех, кто достаточно высоко мотивирован, это, например, папа группы. А для тех, кто низко мотивирован, это различные компании. А, вот я кому отвечал сейчас, только, только одел наушники, поэтому я еще раз повторю. Значит, еще раз. Для тех, кто высоко мотивирован, мы используем папа группы. Для тех, кто низко мотивирован, различные компании. Это может быть день отца, это выставки, например. Поэтому просто это разный, как бы разный формат работы. To change the community attitudes and to 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 show real change, it's better to engage all sectors of the community, including the government. If the government doesn't do not have willing, we can't make change. We can't see even change. In Ethiopian context, civil society in its organizations or NGOs does not have mandate to engage on right-based approach. Policies and procedures are restricted, it's already restricted. But we are committed to our community engaging in you know, making different strategies to even convincing the government and convincing the community. So it's better to engage all sectors to see change. Uh, Kate and I are going to tag team on this one a little bit. Um, so in terms of the scale up, uh, I, I, there have been lots of conversations about that. I think that all of us have had um, a lot of the work that, that we do with fathers, that many other organizations do with fathers, uh, feels like it's on quite a small scale. So you're, you know, you're talking about 500, 1,000 fathers, and that's a big program. Um, so I think part of, and, and these are you know, somewhat resource heavy interventions done often by NGOs. And so a lot of what is really exciting to also hear from all of you and, and things that we've been thinking about is thinking about how these can be um, institutionalized into existing structures, whether it's the health system, whether it's, um, whether it's crisis centers, whether it is social welfare organizations that allow for a similar type of process and intervention, but that happens not as particular projects that have you know, a beginning and an end. Um, anything to add to that? Okay. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the components that make the intervention work. So as a very strict researcher, we don't know. We compared people who participated in the intervention to people who didn't. There are ways to design studies where you could pull out particular components and see. However, we do of course have lots of other research, I mean that's for this particular, you know, piece of, of research. There is lots of other research and there are th you know, theories of change that we, that we bring in. Um, from our perspective, the very explicit focus on d talking about gender and power and making a space for reflection um, is a really key component. Um, and also a place, I think in this case in particular, for working with couples and building particular skills for couples to do things they hadn't necessarily done before. Yeah, and maybe I would add on to that from some of the qualitative research that we collected and some of the, my own interviews with participants from an earlier cycle, um, the emphasis was really a lot on communication. And for the very first time, many of these couples were actually discussing 
things uh, within the household. You know, what are my goals for our children? What are your goals? Uh, what do we want to achieve? And how do we need to work together to achieve that? And actually listening to each other, sometimes for the very first time on particular topics. And that was done through creating spaces within the group where couples are sitting and are told, you know, discuss with each other, but also homework assignments um, and other types of ways that we tried to promote communication between couples. And I think related to that, uh, from men, there was a sense from many of them that I spoke with at least, that through that process, they started to see more value and that their partners had a lots of valuable contributions in terms of decisions within the household, for example, but also that by working together more, um, they could have more time together with their family, their relationship was being strengthened, and there was uh, greater value to the family. Men were seeing, okay, if I actually do this, rather than waiting for my wife to get home, because she's also you know, at the market and, and actively working in the economy, um, you know, we save time. And in the end, that also provides uh, greater resources to our household. So all of that sort of building on itself to say, um, you know, there was a lot of value um, in this type of approach. And men were saying that, you know, that value was enough to make me be able to say that I don't care what other people might be saying about what I'm doing, um, because I see that it's having a return for me and my household and my family. Uh, so I think there's kind of a number of issues there. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you. So uh, I think um, great uh, points coming out of it in terms of looking at it from how do we break the cycle of violence? So, you know, a couple of ending points I would just try to summarize, which were really coming was multi-sectoral approach of looking at uh, the work we do. And I think by when we say we need to have multi-sectoral approach, that doesn't mean that we have to do everything. And that's where I think strategic partnerships come in, is then how do we connect with organizations who are doing different works, but that may have some ways of connecting with, with the work and the objective that these different programs have uh, in, in the context where we are working. So to, to you know, also build that relationship with existing other organizations, especially also to work with women's rights organizations, which is also comes to back to uh, what Marina uh, was telling about is the accountability. Uh, and while, you know, uh, also to be saying that, you know, the, uh, we are accountable towards the community and also at the same time, how do we utilize that opportunity to hold governments to account in, as, as a human rights activist and coming it from a human rights framework? Um, and I think, um, yeah, to, to make sure that, you know, all of our programs um, or projects rather, you know, we keep on using these terms quite interchangeably, but I think for me, pro we need to have programmatic approach to our work because we are talking about changing behaviors of the individuals, of the system. And we are talking about transforming systems that are reinforcing inequalities, injustice, and violence as such. So how that requires quite a long time. And I think that it does require, in that sense, to come from a very from the beginning to uh, have a very strong gender transformative approach in the work, but also at the same time make, you know, make, keep in mind that we have to be working for quite a some time. So come from not our project or a time-bound initiative, but come really from a programmatic lens into the work we are doing. And, and that also helps to inspire a lot of changes uh, among the people we are working, and most importantly, to sustain the work we have been doing. And, and that requires to create certain mechanisms uh, in, the, in the communities or in the villages or the uh, cities we work in, and connect with those with institutional frameworks. So connecting across, you know, that's where I think uh, slightly being fan of socio-ecological approach to look at how do we connect. It's important to connect these individual changes. You know, you told interesting stories. But also to take a next step to how can these individual stories inspire to change or address or transform the systems that are there. And to look at it from a, from a systemic perspective and, and when it comes to gender uh, justice and equality and, and breaking the cycle of violence. So with that, a round of applause to the presenters, really uh, great work um, and really thank you for being first in the plenary uh, and thank you for, for all the good questions and, and inspiring questions that will keep us uh, continue thinking for the rest of the two and slightly more than two days. So thank you very much. And we break for tea now.
uh, we are almost on quite, quite good on time. So yeah, uh, five minutes less than planned. So thank you. Enjoy the tea. Yes, and we are coming back at 4.30. Yeah, thank you.